Hello everyone, this is Carol here with the Apollon. I'm so glad to have you join us. Um, we were planning on doing this through YouTube and then feeding into Facebook, um, but we had a minor technical difficulty. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and not delay it any longer. I will continue to try and fix a problem with YouTube, so we mil still may switch back to YouTube at some point during the evening and we'll go ahead and announce that to you. But um, I'm really excited to introduce you to Kathleen Von Lu. Um, she is recently, uh, or semi-recently, moved here from Nantucket. A year ago. Um, and um, this is her first art presentation here in, uh, at the Apollon, so we're very excited. And she is going to do an artist talk for you. So without further ado, Kathleen. Thanks, Carol. Well, this is really fun, and thank you to all my friends. Where am I supposed to stand? Here? You can stand wherever you'd like. Yeah, it'll, it'll pick you up. Um, thanks for coming. This is a really important thing for me to do to keep moving ahead in my art career, which I got started in a little bit late in life. So anyway, this uh, show popped up on my Facebook, and I thought, dark scents, that's perfect. I have these dark paintings, and I've been wondering, what am I ever going to do with them? Because they're not particularly popular in your usual gallery. Um, I had been painting these dark paintings because of these dark times in which we live. Uh, inevitably, that kind of stuff is going to come out in some way. Um, so I worked on them, and then and they were finished when this show popped up, and my next thought was, oh, now I have to think of titles. That's always really difficult, and uh, I had to actually sit and stare at each one, except that one, Gathering Storm. The other three, this one, this one, the one behind Jan and Everett, and the red landscape. Uh, I know how I went about painting them, so I let that be my guide, and of course I can also see how they turned out. So that being the case, uh, this, this was the first one of the full, now, I'll talk about that one last, Gathering Storm. But of the other three, this was the first one that I tried and completed. Um, it started out, it started out as, uh, Four figures, which those are those are a bunch of my drawings that I've been doing lately. Also, that I decided to bring in, so you can see that. If I happen to see how this one started out, I'll um, I'll point it out. But it had four stick figures, uh, two big, two small. The two big ones were clearly ignoring the two little ones. And the two little ones were down low, kind of, you know, uh, with a pleading, no, that's not it, um, look to them. It didn't go well as a painting because I always paint with a lot of texture and big movements of my arms and um, it, just, it just wasn't working out. So I kept, I just tried to keep in mind that idea of a power struggle. This is one of the few truly abstract paintings that I've done. Um, and I just kept going, I use a palette knife a lot, and I just kept going with uh, the emotion involved with that, and the color choice, of course, and uh, I'm pretty familiar now with how the paint moves and how I tend to move it. And um, this virtually painted itself in one after 
afternoon after I gave up on the stick figures. Uh, so I looked at it for a while, added a few details with the line work that I also like to add to my paintings. And um, this title came to me pretty quick, Contra Tweets. Power struggles, right? <laughs> Um, I could have just called it tweets, but I don't know. I wanted to make sure you knew it was Contra. Um, then, what was the next one I was going to talk about? Let's see. Ah, what matters? Black Lives Matter. That's where part of that title came from. Um, it started out, it's there, a picture of it in its original form after the first day of working on it. Very geometric, like blocks, circles, arcs, angles. Um, so I was really, I thought, it, I was happy with it. Left it for the night, get back to it the next morning. And because it was quite wet, the uh, white and black sort of soaked into each other and the white wasn't nearly white enough anymore. It was just kind of gray. And I started, you know, I was like, okay, I gotta go over this. And I uh, started adding in more white. Um, and what happened was that my own style, which is a lot more organic than geometric shapes, took over. Um, and after, you know, painting away, and after a while, I stepped back and I looked at it and was like, oh, that's really different than what I started out with. Um, thought about it for a while and decided that what I was going to wind up with was a burst of something instead of a pile of something. But it was fine with me. And um, so then I, you know, it was, this had more brushwork than palette knife work in it. But you can see where I've added the line work that I love so much and just incorporate into everything I paint. Um, then the next one was that red one there. Uh, what did I call that? Dark Days. Um, that started out, again, I wanted it to be abstract but uh, my own habit of style eventually just took over. It started with slashes, diagonal slashes of red and purple. And the idea was that I wanted to mimic the idea of injury and bruising. Um, it was also when all the fires were really intense and uh, we couldn't get we, we in Omaha weren't yet discerning the smoke in the atmosphere, but plenty of places were. Uh, and that's a case where um, the, my tendency to do landscape took over, which is fine because uh, I perceive landscape as being a really good representative, representation of everything about this planet that we live on. Uh, and I have a quote from our favorite pastor from Church of the Woods in New Hampshire that I just picked up today from his new newsletter. Um, that the, the landscape is really important wherever you are, whether relatively intact or distorted by humans. So my, my landscapes are rarely distorted by humans when I get to painting, but you'll see it in my drawings if you take a look, that I've got a lot of distorted traffic landscapes. <laughs> um, yeah, traffic out here was a shock to me. I had to ask Jan to help me go driving one day. Uh, okay, so then that brings us to Gathering Storm, which is that blue and green one. 
Um, that was actually painted on purpose to explore the light that happens when, you know, a big thunderstorm. Clouds are covering the sky, but there's still shafts of light hitting the trees. And it's very uh, eerie looking. Um, again, it's a dark painting, so I thought, you know what, allegorically with the title, even though it was intentionally a real storm, um, it fit. And it, it, it fit because it fits with my psyche and how I feel about all the stuff that's happening. Um, so that's that. Then I was just going to mention a little bit, okay, I've already told you I use palette knives most of the time, painting knives. Uh, I use oil pastels for texture and line. Um, oh, this, is, this is the secret to what style and technique is. Um, these are my habits that I developed over years of just seeing what I like. And while like that, trying to be four stick figures, um, I've learned over time that I just can't do that in a painting. It's like handwriting. And those of us who were, had the Palmer method of handwriting, you know, forced into us back in elementary school, all of us emerged eventually with our own handwriting. That's exactly what painting is, is that eventually your own hand will emerge, no matter how hard you try not to make it not to. It will come out. Um, and then I was going to mention that the materials I use, because oil painting, oil paints are not famous for being ecologically sound. Uh, over time, I've learned how to deal with that. One is I buy products that are manufactured by companies who try really hard to reduce the amount of toxicity in their ingredients. The other thing is I never send oil painting products down the drain. Um, I use cut up cotton rags of t-shirts, old sheets, whatever cotton might come my way instead of paper towels. I don't use paper towels or if I do, it's extremely rare. Um, what else, what other kind of products would there be? Um, anything. What I do with the paint tubes and the oily rags uh, is I put them in a metal trash can and then when that's full I take it to hazardous waste. It doesn't go to the ordinary trash. Uh, another teacher of mine explained to me how to do that one time. I don't take the, the brushes to the sink and wash them in the sink. I wash them in the correct products and it, it's a process. If anybody really wants to know, I can teach you. Um, and that's about all I had to say. So now I was going to ask if there's any questions. And if you don't have questions, I have ideas of questions you can ask me. I'll ask you one. How, how have you had to adapt to Nebraska after living on Nantucket so long as far as your artwork goes? Thank you. That's a nice question. Um, I have explained to people that the light, the color, the edges here in Nebraska are very different than the old Northeast maritime New England coastland. I knew that was true because of course I've been out here on and off a lot of times over the years. And uh, it, it took me a couple of months to, I, my first few paintings were very realistic. And I did that on purpose to uh, get used to the color and the edges and the differences. So my palette has changed from my seaside paintings. Even, even the area there that we call the moors is really different looking in space, color, edges, sky than the prairies are, which we've also visited since we moved here. Uh, 
it took some doing and um, to, just to get used to it. But I did, and uh, it's now part, I've made it become part of what I call my inner vocabulary, which is why that turned out that way instead of totally abstract. My inner vocabulary just took over. I think the red one. All right. I imagine living on Nantucket, you're, you mentioned that you like painting landscapes. You, got, you probably painted seascapes and beaches. So yes. what type of landscapes do you enjoy painting from Nebraska? Um, well, the prairies, when we took a trip in February of all times to uh, Niobrara. Um, what's the name of that? The Niobrara Valley Preserve. Niobrara Valley Preserve that the Nature Conservancy runs. Yeah. So it's a huge tract of land. And uh, I, was, um, I was blown away by the sense of space and distance that um, even standing on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, it's completely different. And I think it has to do with the sense of perspective because the rolling grasslands provide you with a little bit of uh, interruption to the line of sight just enough to give the human eye uh, a better sense of the distance, you know, so I can stand by the edge of the ocean and know that I can see 15 miles, it's 15 miles to the horizon line, but um, there's nothing interrupting it except much closer in where you see the waves and, you know, so this was amazing and then we, instead of coming home the way we went, which was mostly along 275, uh, for a long ways, right? Um, we came down the middle of the state. I don't remember that highway, but this was February. There wasn't a lot going on, but there was just enough snow on the ground. I could, there was a period, my, my um, stepdaughter was driving, and there was a period, uh, I was in the back seat. I was leaning over the front seat, just constantly snapping pictures, because I could not believe how far up the road we could see and there was not another single vehicle in sight. <laughs> Unbelievable to me. That's called Nebraska. <laughs> it was, and it was absolutely gorgeous. And I even got the treat of seeing real uh, herders on horseback wow. moving their steer at one point. It was, it was really neat. So I found that to be just incredibly inspiring um, I learned even more about the, the fauna of the grasslands, um, which is, I don't necessarily paint the details of, you know, okay, here's tall bluegrass. Here, you know, I don't do that, but um, I have a sense of it so that uh, I've got two big paintings at home that include that sort of feel and that sort of color and um, in the grasslands. How's that? Any other questions? Do you know when you're finished with the painting? Oh, oh, that's another great question. <laughs> I had a teacher one time who um, just said, when you think you're getting close to done, stand back, look at it, and decide if five more brush strokes would finish it. Yeah. Five, don't do any more than five. And uh, that, uh, yeah, that was one of the greatest teaching tips I ever got. Uh, so this one actually was hard to declare finished. Um, So I think it was five, five more, five more. It went like that. But yeah, that's how, that's how I decide. Uh, I think part of it is over time, you, you know, you, you learn about the, the push-pull effect that you're hoping for, even in an abstract, that you're hoping for some sense of depth. Uh, composition has to 
work. Humans like to see the, um, what's that called? The golden triangle thing? Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just something about the way we see the world with our human eye that, uh, pretty much demands a certain kind of balance that's interesting. I'm not talking about four square. It's more like in thirds. Um, that's how I figure out some of that stuff. Um, one question I thought of that I think of a lot nowadays separated from a gallery that had regular shows and turned over a lot and I could hardly keep up um, is why be an artist at all? Why do I do this? Is it time to just stop and retire and uh, go for walks all day during COVID? Um, and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Um, I am driven to paint. If, if I don't, uh, I just don't feel good. Um, it could be as simple as feeling like I forgot to brush my teeth. It's like that kind of level of discomfort in one way. And, um, and then in another way, it's, I knew from the age of seven at the very first sidewalk art show that my parents took me to, that that was what I needed to do in life. And there's been a lot of stops and starts, but uh, that's, I just keep doing it. And um, hopefully, uh, it comes to something. I don't know what that is. That I, that I sell enough to pay for my materials. <laughs> that is really nice. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything? No? Okay. Well, um, I want to say thank you so much, Kathleen, for doing this. Clearly, you were really well prepared. You shared a lot of your insight um, as an artist um, in general in terms of um, what you see in your approach and even just some differences in doing art here in Nebraska versus doing art in Nantucket. So um, really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for being here. Love your art. So if you're watching from home, Later on, I'm gonna go around. Um, I've been posting some uh, discussion points of highlighting different artists and their artwork, but I am gonna go around and walk around the room too and give you um, a sense of some of the things that Kathleen and, and closer up of what um, her artwork looks like so you can get a better sense of what she was talking about on some of these things. So thank you so much. Thanks, Carol. Thanks a lot for hearing this. <laughs>
kind of skulls that you see with the pumpkin and then uh, the one to the left of that. Uh, it's called Trick, uh, the skinny doll in there. Just having fun with some Halloween uh, spirit and, and trying to put smiles around. And then the other one is, uh, I believe that's October Sunset. Uh, and I just tried to kind of incorporate those colors into uh, a macabre sense of, of uh, the season and, and what's going on right now as well in the world. So without further ado, uh, Carol introduced me to that as a poet. And again, I'm a little unprepared. Uh, I have not, can't read my own writing when I don't rewrite. And, uh, but I chose a couple for you. And the first one, uh, I did make up my own word. So I uh, apologize if that offends anybody. All words are made up, right? So, uh, and it's called hypocriticality. So it's like hypocrisy and reality kind of put together. So uh, this is kind of short and uh, maybe a little sweet, but I'll just go ahead and start it. Uh, and thank you again, Paul, for showing up. I really appreciate it very much. So it starts like this. Is there an idea, a time to write, all cards in, turn off the light, where the and in a different pen, not used to it, I need something more heavy, a ruler for the late and earlies. Back to it, the stuff I am hearing, a lack interfering, 30 seconds or less on the line, headway to the obvious conspiracy. The hypocrisy deliberate and the narrative to incarnate. I can relax and it begins with this and a different pen on to the darker sense, which is my next poem for you. So uh, this one was written. I woke up in the middle of the night. I wrote it uh, with the wrong pen as well. So I had to go in and make sure I could read what I wrote. So. Please pardon me if I skip a little bit. I'm usually a little bit more professional than this, but uh, it's a very intimate setting and it's a little intimidating, so I appreciate it. I also enjoy it very much. Uh, so this is called Dark Sense. Uh, this is what I kind of wrote for the show. It's not what I kind of wrote for the show. This is what I wrote for the show, and uh, it's a little serious, but I uh, hopefully you enjoy it either way. <coughs> Oh, I wanted to add, my stuff's a little cryptic. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to explain things. Uh, things just purely get written on my state of mind at the time, whether I'm tired or anxious or uh, angry, what have you. I'm sure every artist in here can relate to that. So uh, any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer. So a dark sense, analytical, in reference to mind, typical in paying any of it, the news and a key to rise above it, a ghost in the dark sense, the wonder of things, too thrilling, too intense, a killing thriller, televised, realized, free, but with no eyes, a personal product machine, its ghost, a vampire, the wearer, and the bag over the head killer, a dark sense, sensing things to come, and the other side of a fence. To that house, a perfectly normal Midwest suburb home, but a place making monsters a dark sense of it. The imposters of love and grace, but a very real dark place. And that's my dark sense for you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thanks, Carol. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate it. So I um, want to quick really announce that we have we have um, Shalene who's here in the next room. She does henna art, so if anybody is interested, she's wearing a mask, she'll make sure everything is cleaned up. So if you're interested, feel free. Um, she's got a nice table set up there for you. Um, and um, so we'll go ahead and transition now to um, a reading of The Raven um, by Edgar Allan Poe um, from Matt. 
Uh, so please, uh, welcome, join us now. And I'm going to set this down so you can see. Yeah. And we'll lower the microphone too so that people cool. can hear you. To my page. Okay. All right, can, can you know me? All right, I think that should be all right. Uh, hi, I'm Matt. Sorry, I don't have any like crazy like introduction or, or anything like that. <laughs> I'm just gonna read like a spooky like poem from like Edgar Allan Poe, and um, hopefully you guys like it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Once upon a midnight jury. While I pondered, weak and weary, over many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, oh, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had, I had sought to borrow from my books her cease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare raven maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain wrestling of each purple curtain thrilled me and filled me with fantastic terrors never, never felt before. So that now, to still a beating of my heart, I stood repeating to some visitor entering entrance at my chamber door, to some late visitor entering entrance at my chamber door. Uh, th this it is, <laughs> and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating, then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I was scarce sure that I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, Dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gives no token, and the only word there was spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window's lattice. Let me see then where that is, and the mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt, a flutter, and there stepped a stately raven of a saintly days of yore. Not the least epicence may he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with me and of lord or lady, peered, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a, upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of its countenance of war, though thy crest be shown and shaven now, I said, Art thou no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore? Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly foul to hear his discourse so plainly, although his answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot give a grin that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing a bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door was such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on a placid bus spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did abhor. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, 
till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. And then the bird said, <laughs> nevermore. Started at the stillness, broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till a song one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling my sad fancy and smiling, straight I wheeled the cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking. Fancy on the fancy thinking, what this omnibus bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant, and its croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to a fowl whose fiery eyes now burned in my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my heart in ease reclining, on the cushioned velvet lining on that lamp light gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the light lamp gloated o'er, she shall pass, ah, oh, nevermore. Then, methought, dear retensor, her freedom from an unseen censor, swung by ser seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tuffled floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath let thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepotheme from my, thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepotheme, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, <laughs> never more. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still a bird or devil, whether tempter sent or tempest tossed, thee here ashore, desolute yet all, all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly I implore, is there, is there a bum and gilad? Tell me, tell me I implore, quoth the raven, never more. Prophet said I, thing of evil, prophet still a bird or devil, but by that heaven that bends above us, by thy God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden if, within the distant Aden, it shall clasp the sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp the rare radiant maiden from the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, never more. Be that word or sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shriek up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and nice plutonium shore. Leave me no black plume as a token of that lie, that, that lie soul has spoken. Leave thy loneliness unbroken. Quit the bus above my door. Take thy beat from my heart and take thy form from my, from my door. Quoth the raven, never more. And the raven, never fleeting, still sitting, still is sitting on a pale bus of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming. And a lamp light o'er him streaming throws a shadow on, on the floor. And my soul from out the shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never more. That's it. <laughs> all righty. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate it. Um, everyone at home, we're going to end um, with that, um, and and I'll go ahead and walk around and show you the artwork. But I want to allow people to walk around and see the artwork themselves here at the Apollon. Thank you for joining us uh, at home, and um, stay safe and have a wonderful evening. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and walk around and show you the art, and everyone here can go ahead and mingle and walk around and talk. There is um, wine available and water available, so please help yourself. Okay. Okay, so let me switch this around so you can see it here. Okay, so um, over here, uh, we'll start with the raven. How appropriate. So um, the raven is uh, acrylic on canvas created by Jeffrey Ballard, uh, who has a couple of pieces here at the Apollon. And then followed by um, 
three demons at play. I'm going to move in a little closer so you can see uh, the demons and their horns and um, their wings there. That is revised ceramic relief. So here is Kathleen's piece that uh, one of the pieces she talked about earlier during the artist, artist talk. And this is oil on canvas. It's called What Matters. Uh, so over here, I'll start at the top and kind of work your way down here. A very interesting piece. Very interesting. So this one's called Doyle Meets Vampira uh, by Bart.